This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Rainer. War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. Translated by Louise and Alma Maud. Book 1, Chapter 1. Well, Prince, so Genoa and Luca are now just family estates of the Bonapartes. But I warn you, if you don't tell me that this means war, if you still try to defend the infamies and horrors perpetrated by that Antichrist, I really believe he is Antichrist, I will have nothing more to do with you, and you are no longer my friend, no longer my faithful slave, as you call yourself. But... How do you do? I see I have frightened you. Sit down and tell me all the news. It was in July, 1805, and the speaker was a well-known Anna Pavlovna Schere, maid of honor and the favorite of the Empress Maria Fyodorovna. With these words she greeted Prince Vasily Kuragin, a man of high rank and importance, who was the first to arrive at her reception. Anna Pavlovna had had a cough for some days. She was, as she said, suffering from la grippe, grippe being then a new word in St. Petersburg, only used by the elite. All her invitations, without exception written in French and delivered by a scarlet-livered footman that morning, ran as follows. If you have nothing better to do, count or prince, and if the prospect of spending an evening with a poor invalid is not too terrible, I shall be very charmed to see you tonight between seven and ten. Annette Scherer Heavens, what a violent attack, replied the prince, not in the least disconcerted by this reception. He had just entered, wearing an embroidered court uniform, knee breeches and shoes, and had stars on his breast and a serene expression on his flat face. He spoke in that refined French in which our grandfathers not only spoke but thought, and with a gentle patronizing intonation natural to a man of importance who had grown old in society and at court. He went up to Anna Pavlovna, kissed her hand, presenting to her his bold, scented and shining head, and complacently seated himself on the sofa. First of all, dear friend, tell me how you are. Set your friend's mind at rest, he said without altering his tone, beneath the politeness and affected sympathy of which indifference and even irony could be discerned. Can one be well while suffering morally? Can one be calm in times like these if one has any feelings? said Anna Pavlovna. You are staying the whole evening, I hope. And the feet at the English ambassadors? Today is Wednesday. I must put in an appearance there, said the prince. My daughter is coming for me to take me there. I thought today's feat had been cancelled. I confess, all these festivities and fireworks are becoming wearisome. If they had known that you wished it, the entertainment would have been put off, said the prince, who, like a wound-up clock, by force of habit, said things he did not even wish to be believed. Don't tease. Well, and what has been decided about Navazilkia's dispatch? You know everything. What can one say about it? replied the prince in a cold, listless tone. What has been decided? They have decided that Bonaparte has burned his boats, and I believe that we are ready to burn ours. Prince Vasily always spoke languidly, like an actor repeating a stale part. Anna Pavlovna Shera, on the contrary, despite her forty years, overflowed with animation and impulsiveness. To be an enthusiast has become her social vocation, and sometimes, even when she did not feel like it, she became enthusiastic in order not to disappoint the expectation of those who knew her. The subdued smile, which, though it did not suit her faded features, always played round her lips, expressed as in a spoiled child, a continual consciousness of her charming defect, which she neither wished nor could, not considered it necessary, to correct. In the midst of a conversation on political matters, Anna Pavlovna burst out. Oh, don't speak to me of Austria. 
Perhaps I don't understand things, but Austria never has wished and does not wish for war. She is betraying us. Russia alone must save Europe. Our gracious sovereign recognizes his high vocation and will be true to it. That is the one thing I have faith in. Our good and wonderful sovereign has to perform the noblest role on earth, and he is so virtuous and noble that God will not forsake him. He will fulfill his vocation and crush the hydra of revolution, which has become more terrible than ever in the person of this murderer and villain. We alone must avenge the blood of the just one, whom, I ask you, can we rely on? England, with her commercial spirit, will not and cannot understand the Emperor Alexander's loftiness and soul. She has refused to evacuate Malta. She wanted to find, and still seeks, some secret motive in our actions. What answer did Novosiltiev get? None. The English have not understood, and cannot understand, the self-abnegation of our emperor, who wants nothing for himself, but only desires the good of mankind. And what have they promised? Nothing. And what little they have promised they will not perform. Prussia has always declared that Bonaparte is invincible, and that all Europe is powerless before him. And I don't believe a word that Hardenburg says, or Haugwitz either. This famous Prussian neutrality is just a trap. I have faith only in God, and the lofty destiny of our adored monarch. He will save Europe. She suddenly paused, smiling at her own impetuosity. I think that the prince was a smile that if you have been sent, instead of our dear Winzigerod, you would have captured the king of Prussia's consent by assault. You are so eloquent. Will you give me a cup of tea? In a moment. Apropos, she added, becoming calm again. I am expecting two very interesting men tonight. Le Vicomte de Mortemar, who is connected with the Montmorencis through the Rohans, one of the best French families. He is one of the genuine emigres, the good ones, and also the Abbe Moriot. Do you know the profound thinker? He has been received by the emperor, had you heard? I shall be delighted to meet them, said the prince. But tell me, he added with a studied carelessness, as if it had only just occurred to him, though the question he was about to ask was the chief motive of his visit. Is it true? that the Dovanger Empress wants Baron Funke to be appointed first secretary at Vienna? The Baron, by all accounts, is a poor creature. Prince Vasili wished to obtain this post for his son, but others were trying through the Dovanger Empress Maria Fyodorovna to secure it for the Baron. Anna Pavlovna almost closed her eyes to indicate that neither she nor anyone else had a right to criticize what the empress desired or was pleased with. Baron Funke had been recommended to the Dovenga empress by her sister, was all she said in a dry and mournful tone. As she named the empress, Anna Pavlovna's face suddenly assumed an expression of profound and sincere devotion and respect mingled with sadness and this occurred every time she mentioned her illustrious patroness. She added that her majesty had designed to show Baron Funke Bucot de steam, and again her face clouded over with sadness. The prince was silent and looked indifferent, but, with a womanly and courtier-like quickness and tact habitual to her, Anna Pavlovna wished both to rebuke him. For daring to speak, he had done of a man recommended to the empress, and at the same time to console him. So she said, Now about your family. Do you know that since your daughter came out, everyone has been enraptured by her? They say she is amazingly beautiful. The prince bowed to signify his respect and gratitude. I often think, she continued after a short pause, drawing nearer to the prince, and smiling amiably at him as if to show that political and social topics were ended, and the time had come for intimate conversation. I often think how unfairly sometimes the joys of life are distributed. Why has fate given you two such splendid children? 
I don't speak of Anatole, your youngest. I don't like him, she added in a tone admitting of no rejoinder and raising her eyebrows. Two such charming children, and really you appreciate them less than anyone, and so you don't deserve to have them. And she smiled her ecstatic smile. I can't help it, said the prince. Lavata would have said I lack the bump of paternity. Don't joke. I mean to have a serious talk with you. Do you know I am dissatisfied with your younger son? Between ourselves. And her face assumed its melancholy expression. He was mentioned at Her Majesty's, and you were pitied. The prince answered nothing. But she looked at him significantly, awaiting a reply. He frowned. What would you have me do? he said at last. You know I did all a father could for their education, and they have both turned out fools. Hippolyte is at least a quiet fool, but Anatole is an active one. That's the only difference between them. He said this, smiling in a way more natural and animated than usual, so that the wrinkles round his mouth very clearly revealed something unexpectedly coarse and unpleasant. And why are children born to such men as you? If you were not a father, there would be nothing I could reproach you with, said Anna Pavlovna, looking up pensively. I am your faithful slave, and to you alone I can confess that my children are the bane of my life. It is the cross I have to bear. That is how I explain it to myself. It can't be helped. He said no more, but expressed his resignation to cruel fate by a gesture. Anna Pavlovna meditated. Have you never thought of marrying your prodigal son Anatole? She asked. They say old maids have a mania for matchmaking, and though I don't feel that weakness in myself as yet, I know a little person who is very unhappy with her father. She's a relation of yours, Princess Marie Bolonskaya. Prince Vasily did not reply, though, with the quickness of memory and perception befitting a man of the world, he indicated by a movement of the head that he was considering this information. Do you know, he said at last, evidently unable to check the sad current of his thoughts, that Anatole is costing me forty thousand roubles a year? And, he went on after a pause, what will be in five years if he goes on like this? Presently he added, that's what we fathers have to put up with. Is this princess of yours rich? Her father is very rich and stingy. He lives in the country. He is a well-known Prince Balonsky, who had to retire from the army under the late emperor, and was nicknamed the King of Prussia. He is very clever, but eccentric, and a bore. The poor girl is very unhappy. She has a brother. I think you know him. He married Lise Meinen lately. He is an aide-de-camp of Kutuzov's, and will be here tonight. Listen, dear Annette, said the prince, suddenly taking Anna Pavlovna's hand and for some reason drawing it downwards. Arrange that affair for me, and I shall always be your most devoted slave. Slave with an F, as a village elder of mine writes in his reports. She is rich and of good family, and that's all I want and with the familiarity and easy grace peculiar to him, he raised the maid of honor's hand to his lips, kissed it, and swung it to and fro as he lay back in his armchair, looking in another direction. Attendez, said Anna Pavlovna, reflecting. I'll speak to Lise, young Bolonsky's wife, this very evening, and perhaps the thing can be arranged. It shall be on your family's behalf, that I'll start my apprenticeship as old maid. End of chapter 1 War and Peace Book 1, Chapter 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Stuart Wills
Chapter Two. Anna Pavlovna's drawing room was gradually filling. The highest Petersburg society was assembled there. People differing widely in age and character, but alike in the social circle to which they belonged. Prince Vasily's daughter, the beautiful Helena, came to take her father to the ambassador's entertainment. She wore a ball dress, and her badge was maid of honor. The youthful little Princess Bolkonskaya, known as la femme la plus séduisante de Petersburg, the most fascinating woman in Petersburg, was also there. She had been married during the previous winter, and, being pregnant, did not go to any large gatherings, but only to small receptions. Prince Vasily's son, Hippolyta, had come with Mortmart, whom he introduced. The Abbe Morio and others had also come. To each new arrival, Anna Pavlovna said, "'You have not yet seen my aunt,' or, "'You do not know my aunt,' and very gravely conducted him or her to a little old lady wearing large bows of ribbon in her cap, who had come sailing in from another room as soon as the guests began to arrive. And, slowly turning her eyes from the visitor to her aunt, Anna Pavlovna mentioned each one's name, and then left them. Each visitor performed the ceremony of greeting this old aunt, whom not one of them knew, not one of them wanted to know, and not one of them cared about. Anna Pavlovna observed these greetings with mournful and solemn interest and silent approval. The aunt spoke to each of them in the same words, about their health and her own, and the health of Her Majesty, who, thank God, was better to-day. And each visitor, though politeness prevented his showing impatience, left the old woman with a sense of relief at having performed a vexatious duty, and did not return to her the whole evening. The young Princess Bolkonskaya had brought some work in a gold-embroidered velvet bag. Her pretty little upper lip, on which a delicate dark down was just perceptible, was too short for her teeth, but it lifted all the more sweetly and was especially charming when she occasionally drew it down to meet the lower lip. As is always the case with a thoroughly attractive woman, her defect, the shortness of her upper lip and her half-open mouth, seemed to be her own special and peculiar form of beauty. Everyone brightened at the sight of this pretty young woman, so soon to become a mother, so full of life and health, and carrying her burden so lightly. Old men, and dull, dispirited young ones, who looked at her, after being in her company and talking to her for a little while, felt as if they too were becoming, like her, full of life and health. All who talked to her, and at each word saw her bright smile and the constant gleam of her white teeth, thought that they were in a specially amiable mood that day. The little princess went round the table with quick, short, swaying steps, her work-bag on her arm, and, gaily spreading out her dress, sat down on a sofa near the silver samovar, as if all she was doing was a pleasure to herself and to all around her. "'I have brought my work,' she said in French, displaying her bag and addressing all present. "'Mind, Annette, I hope you have not played a wicked trick on me,' she added, turning to her hostess. "'You wrote that it was to be quite a small reception, and just see how badly I am dressed.' And she spread out her arms to show her short-waisted, lace-trimmed, dainty grey dress, girdled with a broad ribbon just below the breast. "'Soyez tranquille, Lisa. You will always be prettier than any one else,' replied Anna Pavlovna. "'You know,' said the princess, in the same tone of voice, and still in French, turning to a general, "'My husband is deserting me. He is going to get himself killed. "'Tell me what this wretched war is for,' she added, addressing Prince Vasily. "'And without waiting for an answer, she turned to speak to his daughter, the beautiful Helena. "'What a delightful woman this little princess is,' said Prince Vasily to Anna Pavlovna. "'One of the next arrivals was a stout, heavily built young man, with close-cropped hair, spectacles, the light-coloured breeches fashionable at that time, a very high ruffle, and a brown dress coat. This stout young man was an illegitimate son of Count Bezhikov, 
a well-known grandee of Catherine's time, who now lay dying in Moscow. The young man had not yet entered either the military or civil service, as he had only just returned from abroad, where he had been educated, and this was his first appearance in society. Anna Pavlovna greeted him with the nod she accorded to the lowest hierarchy in her drawing-room. But, in spite of this lowest-grade greeting, a look of anxiety and fear, as at the sight of something too large and unsuited to the place, came over her face when she saw Pierre enter. Though he was certainly rather bigger than the other men in the room, her anxiety could only have reference to the clever, though shy, but observant and natural expression, which distinguished him from every one else in that drawing-room. "'It is very good of you, Monsieur Pierre, to come and visit a poor invalid,' said Anna Pavlovna, exchanging an alarmed glance with her aunt, as she conducted him to her. Pierre murmured something unintelligible, and continued to look round as if in search of something. On his way to the aunt, he bowed to the little princess with a pleased smile, as to an intimate acquaintance. Anna Pavlovna's alarm was justified, for Pierre turned away from the aunt without waiting to hear her speech about Her Majesty's health. Anna Pavlovna, in dismay, detained him with the words, "'Do you know the Abbe Morio? He is a most interesting man.' "'Yes, I have heard of his scheme for perpetual peace, and it is very interesting.' but hardly feasible. "'You think so,' rejoined Anna Pavlovna, in order to say something, and get away to attend to her duties as hostess. But Pierre now committed a reverse act of impoliteness. First he had left a lady before she had finished speaking to him, and now she continued to speak to another who wished to get away. With his head bent, and his big feet spread apart, he began explaining his reasons for thinking the abbé's plan chimerical. "'We will talk of it later,' said Anna Pavlovna, with a smile. And, having got rid of this young man who did not know how to behave, she resumed her duties as hostess, and continued to listen and watch, ready to help at any point where the conversation might happen to flag. As the foreman of a spinning mill, when he has set the hands to work, goes round and notices here a spindle that has stopped, or there one that creaks and makes more noise than it should, and hastens to check the machine, or set it in proper motion, so Anna Pavlovna moved about her drawing-room, approaching now a silent, now a too noisy group, and by a word or slight rearrangement kept the conversational machine in steady, proper, and regular motion. But amid these cares her anxiety about Pierre was evident. She kept an anxious watch on him when he approached the group round Mortemart, to listen to what was being said there, and again when he passed to another group whose centre was the abbé. Pierre had been educated abroad, and this reception at Anna Pavlovna's was the first he had attended in Russia. He knew that all the intellectual lights of Petersburg were gathered there, and, like a child in a toy-shop, didn't know which way to look, afraid of missing any clever conversation that was to be heard. Seeing the self-confident and refined expression on the faces of those present, he was always expecting to hear something very profound. At last he came up to Morio. Here the conversation seemed interesting, and he stood waiting for an opportunity to express his own views, as young people are fond of doing. End of chapter 2《白鹿》Tolstoy, translated by Almer and Louise Maud. Book One, Chapter Three, read for LibriVox by Nomenfile. Anna Pavlovna's reception was in full swing. The spindles hummed steadily and ceaselessly on all sides, with the exception of the aunt, beside whom sat only one elderly lady, who, with her thin, careworn face, was rather out of place in this brilliant society. The whole company had settled into three groups. One, chiefly masculine, had formed round the abbé. Another, of young people, was grouped round the beautiful Princess Helene, Prince Vasily's daughter, and the little Princess Bolkonskaya, very pretty and rosy, though rather too plump for her age. The third group was gathered round Montmartre and Anna Pavlovna. 
The vicomte was a nice-looking young man, with soft features and polished manners, who evidently considered himself a celebrity, but out of politeness modestly placed himself at the disposal of the circle in which he found himself. Anna Pavlovna was obviously serving him up as a treat to her guests. As a clever maitre d'hôtel serves up as a specially choice delicacy a piece of meat that no one who had seen it in the kitchen would have cared to eat, so Anna Pavlovna served up to her guests first the vicomte and then the abbé, as particularly choice morsels. The group about Montmartre immediately began discussing the murder of the Duc d'Aiguin. The vicomte said that the Duc d'Aiguin had perished by his own magnanimity, and that there were particular reasons for Bonaparte's hatred of him. "'Ah, yes, do tell us all about it, vicomte,' said Anna Pavlovna, with a pleasant feeling that there was something a la Louis the Fifteenth in the sound of that sentence. "'Contesnos cela, vicomte.' The vicomte bowed and smiled courteously, in token of his willingness to comply. Anna Pavlovna arranged the group around him, inviting everyone to listen to his tale. "'The vicomte knew the duke personally,' whispered Anna Pavlovna to one of her guests. "'The vicomte is a wonderful raconteur,' said she to another. "'How evidently he belongs to the best society,' she said to a third. And the vicomte was served up to the company in the choicest and most advantageous style, like a well-garnished joint of roast beef on a hot dish. The vicomte wished to begin his story and gave a subtle smile. "'Come over here, Helen, dear,' said Anna Pavlovna to the beautiful young princess who was sitting some way off the centre of another group. The princess smiled. She rose with the same unchanging smile with which she had first entered the room, the smile of a perfectly beautiful woman. With the slightest rustle of her white dress, trimmed with moss and ivy, with a gleam of her white shoulders, glossy hair, and sparkling diamonds, she passed between the men who made way for her, not looking at any of them, but smiling on all, as if graciously allowing each the privilege of admiring her beautiful figure and shapely shoulders, back, and bosom, which in the fashion of those days were very much exposed. And she seemed to bring the glamour of the ballroom with her as she moved toward Anna Pavlovna. Helene was so lovely that not only did she not show any trace of coquetry, but, on the contrary, she even appeared shy of her unquestionable and all-too-victorious beauty. She seemed to wish, but to be unable to diminish its effect. "'How lovely!' everyone said who saw her, and the vicomte lifted his shoulders and dropped his eyes as if startled by something extraordinary when she took her seat opposite and beamed upon him also with her unchanging smile. "'Madam, I doubt my ability before such an audience,' he said, smiling and inclining his head. The princess rested her bare, round arm on a little table and considered a reply unnecessary. She smilingly waited. All the time the story was being told, she sat upright, glancing now at her beautiful round arm, altered in its shape by its pressure on the table, now at her still more beautiful bosom, on which she readjusted a diamond necklace. From time to time she smoothed the folds of her dress, and whenever the story produced an effect, she glanced at Anna Pavlovna, at once adopted just the expression she saw on the maid of honor's face, and again relapsed into her radiant smile. The little princess had also left the tea-table and followed Helene. "'Wait a moment, I'll get my work. Now then, what are you thinking of?' she went on, turning to Prince Hippolyte. "'Fetch my work-bag.' There was a general movement as the princess— smiling and talking merrily to everyone at once, sat down and gaily arranged herself in the seat. "'Now I am all right,' she said, and asking the vicomte to begin, she took up her work. Prince Hippolyte, having brought the work-bag, joined the circle, and, moving a chair close to hers, seated himself beside her. Le charmant Hippolyte was surprising by his extraordinary resemblance to his beautiful sister, but yet more by the fact that in spite of this resemblance he was exceedingly ugly. His features were like his sister's, but while in her case everything was lit up by a joyous, self-satisfied, youthful and constant smile of animation, and by the wonderful classic beauty of her figure, 
His face, on the contrary, was dulled by imbecility and a constant expression of sullen self-confidence, while his body was thin and weak. His eyes, nose, and mouth all seemed puckered into a vacant, wearied grimace, and his arms and legs always fell into unnatural positions. "'It's not going to be a ghost story,' he said, sitting down beside the princess, and hastily adjusting his lorgnette, as if without this instrument he could not begin to speak. "'Why, no, my dear fellow,' said the astonished narrator, shrugging his shoulders. "'Because I hate ghost stories,' said Prince Hippolyte, in a tone which showed that he only understood the meaning of his words after he had uttered them. He spoke with such self-confidence that his hearers could not be sure whether what he said was very witty or very stupid. He was dressed in a dark green dress coat, knee-breeches of the color of quis de nif efere, as he called it, shoes and silk stockings. The vicomte told his tale very neatly. It was an anecdote then current to the effect that the Duc d'Aiguille had gone secretly to Paris to visit Mademoiselle Georges, that at her house he came upon Bonaparte, who also enjoyed the famous actress's favors, and that in his presence Napoleon happened to fall into one of the fainting fits to which he was subject, and was thus at the Duke's mercy. The latter spared him, and this magnanimity Bonaparte subsequently repaid by death. The story was very pretty and interesting, especially at the point where the rivals suddenly recognized one another, and the ladies looked agitated. Charming, said Anna Pavlovna, with an inquiring glance at the little princess. Charming, whispered the little princess, sticking a needle into her work, as if to testify that the interest and fascination of the story prevented her from going on with it. The vicomte appreciated this silent praise, and smiling gratefully, prepared to continue. But just then, Anna Pavlovna, who had kept a watchful eye on the young man who so alarmed her, noticed that he was talking too loudly and vehemently with the abbé, so she hurried to the rescue. Pierre had managed to start a conversation with the abbé about the balance of power, and the latter, evidently interested by the young man's simple-minded eagerness, was explaining his pet theory. Both were talking and listening too eagerly and too naturally, which was why Anna Pavlovna disapproved. The means are the balance of power in Europe and the rights of the people, the abbé was saying. It is only necessary for one powerful nation like Russia, barbaric as she is said to be, to place herself disinterestedly at the head of an alliance having for its object the maintenance of the balance of power in Europe, and it would save the world. But how are you to get such a balance? Pierre was beginning at the moment Anna Pavlovna came up and, looking severely at Pierre, asked the Italian how he stood the Russian climate. The Italian's face instantly changed and assumed an offensively affected, sugary expression, evidently habitual to him when conversing with women. I am so enchanted by the brilliancy of the wit and culture of the society, more especially of the feminine society, in which I have the honor of being received, that I have not yet had time to think of the climate, he said. Not letting the abbé and Pierre escape, Anna Pavlovna, the more conveniently to keep them under observation, brought them into the larger circle. End of chapter 3just then, another visitor entered the drawing-room. Prince Andrew Bolkonsky, the little princess's husband. He was a very handsome young man, of medium height, with firm, clear-cut features. Everything about him, from his weary, bored expression, to his quiet, measured step, offered the most striking contrast to his little wife. It was evident that he not only knew everyone in the drawing-room, but had found them to be so tiresome that it wearied him to look at or listen to them. And among all these faces that he found so tedious, none seemed to bore him so much as that of his pretty wife. He turned away from her with a grimace that distorted his handsome face, kissed Anna Pavlovna's hand, and screwing up his eyes scanned the whole company. "'You are off to the war, Prince?' said Anna Pavlovna. 
General Kutuzov, said Bolkonsky, speaking French and stressing the last syllable of the general's name like a Frenchman, has been pleased to take me as his aide de camp. And Lisa, your wife? She will go to the country. Are you not ashamed to deprive us of your charming wife? Andre, said his wife, addressing her husband in the same coquettish manner in which she spoke to other men. The Vicomte has been telling us such a tale about Mademoiselle Georges and Bonaparte. Prince Andrew screwed up his eyes and turned away. Pierre, who from the moment Prince Andrew had entered the room, had watched him with glad, affectionate eyes, now came up and took his arm. Before he looked round, Prince Andrew frowned again, expressing his annoyance with whoever was touching his arm. But when he saw Pierre's beaming face, he gave him an unexpectedly kind and pleasant smile. "'There now, so you too are in the great world,' he said to Pierre. "'I knew you would be here,' replied Pierre. "'I will come to supper with you, may I?' he added in a low voice, so as not to disturb the vicomte, who was continuing his story. "'No, impossible,' said Prince Andrew, laughing and pressing Pierre's hand, to show that there was no need to ask the question. He wished to say something more, but at that moment Prince Vasily and his daughter got up to go, and the two young men rose to let them pass. "'You must excuse me, my dear Vicomte," said Prince Vasily to the Frenchman, holding him down by the sleeve in a friendly way to prevent his rising. "'This unfortunate fete at the ambassadors deprives me of a pleasure and obliges me to interrupt you.' "'I'm very sorry to leave your charming party,' he said to Anna Pavlovna. His daughter, Princess Helene, passed between the chairs, lightly holding up the folds of her dress, and the smile shone still more radiantly on her beautiful face. Pierre gazed at her with rapturous, almost frightened eyes as she passed him. "'Very lovely,' said Prince Andrew. "'Very,' said Pierre. In passing, Prince Vasily seized Pierre's hand and said to Anna Pavlovna, "'Educate this bear for me. "'He has been staying with me for a whole month, "'and this is the first time I have seen him in society. "'Nothing is so necessary for a young man "'as the society of clever women.' "'Anna Pavlovna smiled and promised to take Pierre in hand. "'She knew his father to be a connection of Prince Vasily's. "'The elderly lady, who had been sitting with the old aunt, "'rose hurriedly and overtook Prince Vasily in the anteroom. All the affectation of interest she had assumed had left her kindly and tear-worn face, and it now expressed only anxiety and fear. "'How about my son Boris, Prince?' she said, hurrying after him into the anteroom. "'I can't remain any longer in Petersburg. Tell me what news I may take back to my poor boy.' Although Prince Vasily listened reluctantly, and not very politely to the elderly lady, even betraying some impatience, she gave him an ingratiating and appealing smile, and took his hand that he might not go away. "'What would it cost you to say a word to the Emperor? And then he would be transferred to the guards at once,' she said. "'Believe me, Princess, I am ready to do all I can,' answered Prince Vasily. "'But it's difficult for me to ask the Emperor. I would advise you to appeal to Rumyantsev through Prince Golitsyn. That would be the best way.' The elderly lady was Princess Drubetskaya, belonging to one of the best families in Russia, but she was poor and, having long been out of society, had lost her former influential connections. She had now come to Petersburg to procure an appointment in the guards for her only son. It was, in fact, solely to meet Prince Vasily that she had obtained an invitation to Anna Pavlovna's reception and had sat listening to the Vicomte's story. Prince Vasily's words frightened her. An embittered look clouded her once handsome face, but only for a moment. Then she smiled again and clutched Prince Vasily's arm more tightly. "'Listen to me, Prince,' she said. "'I have never asked you for anything, and I never will again. Nor have I ever reminded you of my father's friendship for you. But now I entreat you for God's sake. Do this for my son, and I shall always regard you as a benefactor.' She added hurriedly, "'No, do not be angry, but promise.' I have asked Golitsyn, and he has refused. Be the kind-hearted man you always were, she said, trying to smile through the tears that were in her eyes. Papa, we shall be late, said Princess Helene, turning her beautiful head and looking over her classically molded shoulder as she stood waiting by the door. 
Influence in society, however, is a capital which has to be economized if it is to last. Prince Vasily knew this, and, having once realized that if he asked on behalf of all who begged him, he would soon be unable to ask for himself, he became wary of using his influence. But in Princess Trubetskaya's case he felt, after her second appeal, something like qualms of conscience. She had reminded him of what was quite true. He had been indebted to her father for the first steps of his career. Moreover, he could see by her manners that she was one of those women, mostly mothers, who having once made up their minds will not rest until they have gained their end, and are prepared, if necessary, to go on insisting day after day and hour after hour, and even to make scenes. This last consideration moved him. "'My dear Anna Mikhailovna,' he said, with his usual familiarity and weariness of tone, "'it is almost impossible for me to do what you ask, but to prove my devotion to you and how I respect your father's memory, I will do the impossible. Your son shall be transferred to the guards. Here is my hand on it. Are you satisfied?' "'My dear benefactor, this is what I expected from you. I knew your kindness.' He turned to go. "'Wait, just a word. When he has been transferred to the guards,' she faltered, "'you are on good terms with Mikhail Ilarionovich Kutuzov. Recommend Boris to him as an adjutant. Then I shall be at rest, and then—' Prince Vasily smiled. "'No, I won't promise that. You don't know how Kutuzov is pressed since his appointment as commander-in-chief.' He told me himself that all the Moscow ladies have conspired to give him their sons as adjutants. No, but promise I won't let you go, my dear benefactor. Papa, said his beautiful daughter, in the same tone as before, we shall be late. Well, au revoir, good-bye. You hear her. Then tomorrow you will speak to the emperor? Certainly, but about Kutuzov I don't promise. Do promise, do promise, Vasily, cried Anna Mihailovna as he went, with a smile of a coquettish girl, which at one time probably came naturally to her, but was now very ill-suited to her careworn face. Apparently she had forgotten her age, and by force of habit employed all the old feminine arts. But as soon as the prince had gone, her face resumed its former cold, artificial expression. She returned to the group, where the vicomte was still talking, and again pretended to listen, while waiting till it would be time to leave. Her task was accomplished. End of chapter 4《War and Peace》by Leo Tolstoy Translated by Almer and Louise Maud Book 1, Chapter 5 Read for LibriVox by Nomenphile "'And what do you think of this latest comedy, The Coronation at Milan?' asked Anna Pavlovna. "'And the comedy of the people of Genoa and Lucca, laying their petitions before Monsieur Bonaparte, and Monsieur Bonaparte sitting on a throne,' and granting the petitions of the nations. Adorable. It's enough to make one's head whirl. It's as if the whole world had gone crazy. Prince Andrew looked Anna Pavlovna straight in the face with a sarcastic smile. Dieu me la donne, gare à qui la touche. They say he was very fine when he said that, he remarked, repeating the words in Italian. Dio mi la ha dato, guai a chi la tocci. God has given it to me. Let him who touches it beware. I hope this will prove the last drop that will make the glass run over, Anna Pavlovna continued. The sovereigns will not be able to endure this man who is a menace to everything. Sovereigns? I do not speak of Russia, said the Vicomte, polite but hopeless. The sovereigns, madame. What have they done for Louis the Fifteenth? For the Queen? For Madame Elizabeth. Nothing. And he became more animated. And believe me, they are reaping the reward of their betrayal of the Bourbon cause, the sovereigns. Why, they are sending ambassadors to compliment the usurper. And, sighing disdainfully, he changed his position. Prince Hippolyte, who had been gazing at the Vicomte for some time through his lorgnette, suddenly turned completely round toward the little princess and, having asked for a needle, began tracing the Condé coat of arms on the table. He explained this to her with as much gravity 
as if she had asked him to do it. Botton de Gouls. Engrel de Gouls de Azur. My son Candé, he said. The princess listened, smiling. If Bonaparte remains on the throne of France a year longer, the vicomte continued, with the air of a man who, in a matter with which he is better acquainted than anyone else, does not listen to others, but follows the currents of his own thoughts. Things will have gone too far. By intrigues, violence, exile, and executions, French society, I mean good French society, will have been forever destroyed, and then... He shrugged his shoulders and spread his hands. Pierre wished to make a remark, for the conversation interested him, but Anna Pavlovna, who had him under observation, interrupted. The Emperor Alexander, said she, with the melancholy which always accompanied any reference of hers to the imperial family, has declared that he will leave it to the French people themselves to choose their own form of government. And I believe that once free from the usurper, the whole nation will certainly throw itself into the arms of its rightful king, she concluded, trying to be amiable to the royalist emigrant. That's doubtful, said Prince Andrew. Monsieur le Vicomte quite rightly supposes that matters have already gone too far. I think it will be difficult to return to the old regime. From what I have heard, said Pierre, blushing and breaking into the conversation, almost all of the aristocracy has already gone over to Bonaparte's side. It is the Bonapartists who say that, replied the vicomte, looking at Pierre. At the present time it is difficult to know the real state of French public opinion. Bonaparte has said so, remarked Prince Andrew with a sarcastic smile. It was evident that he did not like the vicomte, and was aiming his remarks at him, though without looking at him. I showed them the path to glory, but they did not follow it, Prince Andrew continued after a short silence, again quoting Napoleon's words. I opened my antechambers and they crowded in. I do not know how far he was justified in saying so. Not in the least, replied the vicomte. After the murder of the duke, even the most partial ceased to regard him as a hero. If to some people, he went on, turning to Anna Pavlovna, he was ever a hero. After the murder of the duke, there was one martyr more in heaven, and one hero less on earth. Before Anna Pavlovna and the others had time to smile their appreciation of the vicomte's epigram, Pierre again broke into the conversation, and, though Anna Pavlovna felt sure he would say something inappropriate, she was unable to stop him. The execution of the Duc d'Aguin, declared Monsieur Pierre, was politically necessary, and it seems to me that Napoleon showed greatness of soul by not fearing to take on himself the whole responsibility of the deed. Dieu, mon Dieu, muttered Anna Pavlovna in a terrified whisper. What, Monsieur Pierre, do you consider that assassination shows greatness of soul? said the little princess, smiling and drawing her work closer to her. Oh, oh! exclaimed several voices. Capital! said Prince Hippolyte in English, and began slapping his knee with, with the palm of his hand. The vicomte merely shrugged his shoulders. Pierre looked solemnly at his audience over his spectacles and continued. I say so, he continued desperately, because the Bourbons fled the revolution, leaving the people to anarchy, and Napoleon alone understood the revolution and quelled it. And so, for the general good, he could not stop short for the sake of one man's life. Won't you come over to the other table? suggested Anna Pavlovna. But Pierre continued his speech without heeding her. No, he cried, becoming more and more eager. Napoleon is great because he rose superior to the revolution, suppressed its abuses, preserved all that was good in it, equality of citizenship and freedom of speech and of the press, and only for that reason did he obtain power. Yes, and if, having obtained power, without availing himself of it to commit murder, he had restored it to the rightful king, I should have called him a great man, remarked the vicomte. He could not do that. The people only gave him power that he might rid them of the Bourbons, and because they saw that he was a great man. The revolution was a grand thing. 
continued Monsieur Pierre, betraying by this desperate and provocative proposition his extreme youth and his wish to express all that was in his mind. What? Revolution and regicide a grand thing? Well, after that. But won't you come over to the other table? repeated Anna Pavlovna. Rousseau's social contract, said the vicomte with a tolerant smile. I'm not speaking of regicide. I'm speaking about ideas. Yes, ideas of robbery, murder, and regicide, interjected an ironical voice. Those were extremes, no doubt, but they are not what is important. What is important is the rights of man, emancipation from prejudices, and equality of citizenship, and all these ideas Napoleon has retained in full force. Liberty and equality, said the vicomte contemptuously, as if at last deciding seriously to prove to this youth how foolish his words were. High-sounding words that have long been discredited. Who does not love liberty and equality? Even our Savior preached liberty and equality. Have people since the Revolution been happier? On the contrary, we wanted liberty, but Bonaparte has destroyed it. Prince Andrew kept looking with an amused smile from Pierre to the Vicomte, and from the Vicomte to their hostess. In the first moment of Pierre's outburst, Anna Pavlovna, despite her social experience, was horror-struck. But when she saw that Pierre's sacrilegious words did not exasperate the Vicomte, and had convinced herself that it was impossible to stop him, she rallied her forces and joined the Vicomte in a vigorous attack on the orator. But, my dear Monsieur Pierre, she said, how do you explain the fact of a great man executing a duke, or even an ordinary man, who is innocent and untried? I should like, said the vicomte, to ask how Monsieur explains the 18th Brumaire. Was not that an imposture? It was a swindle, and not at all like the conduct of a great man. And those prisoners he killed in Africa, that was horrible said the little princess, shrugging her shoulders. "'He's a low fellow, say what you will,' remarked Prince Hippolyte. Pierre, not knowing whom to answer, looked at them all and smiled. His smile was unlike the half-smile of other people. When he smiled, his grave, rather gloomy look was instantaneously replaced by another, a childlike, kindly, even rather silly look, which seemed to ask forgiveness." The vicomte, who was meeting him for the first time, saw clearly that this young Jacobin was not so terrible as his words suggested. All were silent. "'How do you expect him to answer you all at once?' said Prince Andrew. "'Besides, in the actions of a statesman, one has to distinguish between his acts as a private person, as a general, and as an emperor. So it seems to me.' "'Yes, yes, of course!' Pierre chimed in, pleased at the arrival of this reinforcement. One must admit, continued Prince Andrew, that Napoleon as a man was great on the bridge of Ancola, and in the hospital at Jaffa, where he gave his hand to the plague-stricken. But there are other acts which it is difficult to justify. Prince Andrew, who had evidently wished to tone down the awkwardness of Pierre's remarks, rose and made a sign to his wife that it was time to go. Suddenly, Prince Hippolyte started up, making signs to everyone to attend, and asking them all to be seated. I was told a charming Moscow story today, and must treat you to it. Excuse me, Vicomte, I must tell it in Russian, or the point will be lost. And Prince Hippolyte began to tell his story, in such Russian as a Frenchman would speak after spending a year in Russia. Everyone waited, so emphatically and eagerly did he demand their attention to his story. There is in Moscow a lady, Undam, and she is very stingy. She must have two footmen behind her carriage, and very big ones. That was her taste. And she had a lady's maid, also big. She said, here Prince Hippolyte paused, evidently collecting his ideas with difficulty. She said, oh yes, she said, girl, to the maid, put on a livery, get up behind the carriage, and come with me while I make some calls. Here Prince Hippolyte spluttered and burst out laughing long before his audience, which produced an effect unfavorable to the narrator. Several persons, among them the elderly lady and Anna Pavlovna, did
did, however, smile. She went. Suddenly, there was a great wind. The girl lost her hat, and her long hair came down. Here he could not contain himself any longer, and went on between gasps of laughter. And the whole world knew! And so the anecdote ended. Though it was unintelligible why he had told it, or why it had to be told in Russian. Still, Anna Pavlovna and the others appreciated Prince Hippolyte's social tact in so agreeably ending Pierre's unpleasant and unamiable outburst. After the anecdote, conversation broke up into insignificant small talk about the last and next balls, about theatricals, and who would meet whom, and when and where. End of chapter 5《War and Peace》Book One, Chapter Six, read for LibriVox.org by Stuart Wills. Having thanked Anna Pavlovna for her charming soirée, the guests began to take their leave. Pierre was ungainly, stout, about the average height, broad, with huge red hands. He did not know, as the saying is, how to enter a drawing room, and still less how to leave one that is, how to say something particularly agreeable before going away. Besides this, he was absent-minded. When he rose to go, he took up instead of his own the general's three-cornered hat, and held it, pulling at its plume, until the general asked him to restore it. All this absent-mindedness and inability to enter a room and converse in it was, however, redeemed by his kindly, simple, and modest expression. Anna Pavlovna, turned toward him, and, with a Christian mildness that expressed forgiveness of his indiscretion, nodded, and said, "'I hope to see you again, but also hope you will change your opinions, my dear Monsieur Pierre.' When she said this, he did not reply, and only bowed. But again everybody saw his smile, which said nothing, unless, perhaps, "'Opinions are opinions, but you see what a capital good-natured fellow I am.' and every one, including Anna Pavlovna, felt this. Prince Andrew had gone out into the hall, and, turning his shoulders to the footman who was helping him on with his cloak, listened indifferently to his wife's chatter with Prince Hippolyta, who had also come into the hall. Prince Hippolyta stood close to the pretty pregnant princess, and stared fixedly at her through his eyeglass. "'Go in, Annette, or you will catch cold,' said the little princess, taking leave of Anna Pavlovna. "'It is settled,' she added, in a low voice. Anna Pavlovna had already managed to speak to Lisa about the match she contemplated between Anatole and the little princess's sister-in-law. "'I will rely on you, my dear,' said Anna Pavlovna, also in a low tone. "'Write to her, and let me know how her father looks at the matter.' Au revoir, and she left the hall. Prince Hippolyta approached the little princess, and, bending his face close to her, began to whisper something. Two footmen, the princess's and his own, stood holding a shawl and a cloak, waiting for the conversation to finish. They listened to the French sentences which to them were meaningless, with an air of understanding, but not wishing to appear to do so. The princess, as usual, spoke smilingly, and listened with a laugh. "'I am very glad I did not go to the ambassador's,' said Prince Hippolyta. "'So dull. It has been a delightful evening, has it not? Delightful!' "'They say the ball will be very good,' replied the princess, drawing up her downy little lip. "'All the pretty women in society will be there.' "'Not all, for you will not be there. Not all.' said Prince Hippolyta, smiling joyfully, and, snatching the shawl from the footman, whom he even pushed aside, he began wrapping it round the princess. Either from awkwardness, or intentionally, no one could have said which, after the shawl had been adjusted he kept his arm around her for a long time, as though embracing her. Still smiling, she gracefully moved away, turning and glancing at her husband. Prince Andrew's eyes were closed, so weary and sleepy did he seem. "'Are you ready?' he asked his wife, looking past her. Prince Hippolyta hurriedly put on his cloak, 
which in the latest fashion reached to his very heels, and, stumbling in it, ran out into the porch following the princess, whom a footman was helping into the carriage. "'Princess, au revoir!' cried he, stumbling with his tongue as well as with his feet. The princess, picking up her dress, was taking her seat in the dark carriage. Her husband was adjusting his sabre. Prince Hippolyta, under the pretense of helping, was in everyone's way. "'Allow me, sir,' said Prince Andrew in Russian, in a cold, disagreeable tone, to Prince Hippolyta, who was blocking his path. "'I am expecting you, Pierre,' he said the same voice, but gently and affectionately. The postillion started, the carriage wheels rattled. Prince Hippolyta laughed spasmodically as he stood in the porch, waiting for the vicomte, who he had promised to take home. "'Well, mon cher,' said the vicomte, having seated himself beside Hippolyta in the carriage, "'your little princess is very nice, very nice indeed, quite French,' and he kissed the tips of his fingers. Hippolyta burst out laughing. "'Do you know you are a terrible chap for all your innocent airs?' continued the vicomte. "'I pity the poor husband, that little officer who gives himself the airs of a monarch.' Hippolytus spluttered again, and amid his laughter said, "'And you were saying that the Russian ladies are not equal to the French? One has to know how to deal with them.' Pierre, reaching the house first, went into Prince Andrew's study like one quite at home, and, from habit, immediately lay down on the sofa, took from the shelf the first book that came to his hand, it was Caesar's Commentaries, and, resting on his elbow, began reading it in the middle. "'What have you done to Mademoiselle Scherer? She will be quite ill now,' said Prince Andrew, as he entered the study, rubbing his small white hands. Pierre turned his whole body, making the sofa creak. He lifted his eager face to Prince Andrew, smiled, and waved his hands. "'That abbé is very interesting, but he does not see the thing in the right light. In my opinion, perpetual peace is possible, but I do not know how to express it, not by a balance of political power.' It was evident that Prince Andrew was not interested in such abstract conversation. "'One can't everywhere say all one thinks, mon cher.' "'Well, have you at last decided on anything? Are you going to be a guardsman or a diplomatist?' asked Prince Andrew, after a momentary silence. Pierre sat up on the sofa, with his legs tucked under him. "'Really, I don't yet know. I don't like either one or the other.' "'But you must decide on something. Your father expects it.' Pierre, at the age of ten, had been sent abroad with an abbé as tutor, and had remained away till he was twenty. When he returned to Moscow, his father dismissed the abbey, and said to the young man, "'Now go to Petersburg, look around, and choose your profession. I will agree to anything. Here is a letter to Prince Vasily, and here is money. Write to me all about it, and I will help you in everything.' Pierre had already been choosing a career for three months, and had not decided on anything. It was about this choice that Prince Andrew was speaking." Pierre rubbed his forehead. "'But he must be a Freemason,' said he, referring to the abbé whom he had met that evening. "'That is all nonsense,' Prince Andrew again interrupted him. "'Let us talk business. Have you been to the horse-guards?' "'No, I have not. Uh, but this is what I have been thinking and wanted to tell you. There is a war now against Napoleon.' Uh, if it were a war for freedom, I could understand it, and she'd be the first to enter the army. But to help England and Austria against the greatest man in the world is not right. Prince Andrew only shrugged his shoulders at Pierre's childish words. He put on the air of one who finds it impossible to reply to such nonsense, but it would, in fact, have been difficult to give any other answer than the one Prince Andrew gave to this naive question. If no one fought except on his own conviction, there would be no wars, he said. And that would be splendid, said Pierre. Prince Andrew smiled ironically. Very likely it would be splendid, but it will never come about. Well, why are you going to the war? asked Pierre. 
What for? I don't know. I must. Besides that I am going, he paused, I am going because the life I am leading here does not suit me. End of chapter 6 War and Peace, Book 1, Chapter 7 Read for LibriVox.org by Stuart Wills The rustle of a woman's dress was heard in the next room. Prince Andrew shook himself, as if waking up, and his face assumed the look it had had in Anna Pavlovna's drawing-room. Pierre removed his feet from the sofa. The princess came in. She had changed her gown for a house-dress as fresh and elegant as the other. Prince Andrew rose, and politely placed a chair for her. "'How is it?' she began, as usual, in French, settling down briskly and fussily in the easy-chair. "'How is it Annette never got married? How stupid you men are not to have married her! Excuse me for saying so, but you have no sense about women. What an argumentative fellow you are, Monsieur Pierre!' "'And I am still arguing with your husband.' "'I can't understand why he wants to go to the war,' replied Pierre, addressing the princess with none of the embarrassment so commonly shown by young men in their intercourse with young women. The princess started. Evidently, Pierre's words touched her to the quick. "'Ah, that is just what I tell him,' said she. "'I don't understand it. I don't in the least understand why men can't live without wars.' How is it that we women don't want anything of the kind, don't need it? Now you shall judge between us. I always tell him, here he is uncle's aide-de-camp, a most brilliant position. He is so well known, so much appreciated by every one. The other day at the Apraxins I heard a lady asking, is that the famous Prince Andrew? I did, indeed. She laughed. He is so well received everywhere. He might easily become aide-de-camp to the Emperor. You know the Emperor spoke to him most graciously. Annette and I were speaking of how to arrange it. What do you think? Pierre looked at his friend, and, noticing that he did not like the conversation, gave no reply. When are you starting? he asked. Oh, don't speak of his going. Don't. I won't hear it spoken of said the princess in the same petulantly playful tone in which she had spoken to Hippolyta in the drawing-room, and which was so plainly ill-suited to the family circle of which Pierre was almost a member. "'Today, when I remembered that all these delightful associations must be broken off, and then you know, André,' she looked significantly at her husband, "'I'm afraid, I'm afraid,' she whispered, and a shudder ran down her back." Her husband looked at her as if surprised to notice that someone besides Pierre and himself was in the room, and addressed her in a tone of frigid politeness. "'What is it you are afraid of, Lisa? I don't understand,' said he. "'There, what egotists men all are! All, all egotists! Just for the whim of his own, goodness only knows why, he leaves me and locks me up alone in the country!' "'With my father and sister, remember,' said Prince Andrew gently. "'Alone all the same, without my friends, and he expects me not to be afraid.' Her tone was now querulous, and her lip drawn back, giving her not a joyful, but an animal, squirrel-like expression. She paused as if she felt it indecorous to speak of her pregnancy before Pierre, though the gist of the matter lay in that. "'I still can't understand what you are afraid of,' said Prince Andrew slowly, not taking his eyes off his wife. The princess blushed and raised her arm with a gesture of despair. "'No, Andrew, I must say you have changed. Oh, how you have!' "'Your doctor tells you to go to bed earlier,' said Prince Andrew. "'You had better go.' The princess said nothing, but suddenly her short, downy lip quivered. Prince Andrew rose, shrugged his shoulders, and walked about the room. Pierre looked over his spectacles with naive surprise, now at him and now at her. 
moved as if about to rise too, but changed his mind. "'Why should I mind Monsieur Pierre being here?' exclaimed the little princess suddenly, her pretty face all at once distorted by a tearful grimace. "'I have long wanted to ask you, Andrew, why you have changed so to me. What have I done to you? You are going to the war, and have no pity for me. Why is it?' "'Lisa,' was all Prince Andrew said. But that one word expressed an entreaty, a threat, and above all conviction that she would herself regret her words. But she went on hurriedly. "'You treat me like an invalid or a child. I see it all. Did you behave like that six months ago?' "'Lisa, I beg you to desist,' said Prince Andrew, still more emphatically. Pierre, who had been growing more and more agitated as he listened to all this, rose and approached the princess. He seemed unable to bear the sight of tears, and was ready to cry himself. "'Calm yourself, princess. It, it seems so to you, because, I assure you, I myself have experienced, and so, because—no, excuse me, an outsider is out of place here. No, don't distress yourself. Good-bye. Prince Andrew caught him by the hand. "'No, wait, Pierre.' The princess is too kind to wish to deprive me of the pleasure of spending the evening with you. No, he thinks only of himself, muttered the princess, without restraining her angry tears. Lisa, said Prince Andrew dryly, raising his voice to the pitch which indicates that patience is exhausted. Suddenly the angry, squirrel-like expression of the princess's pretty face changed into a winning and piteous look of fear. Her beautiful eyes glanced at her husband's face, and her own assumed the timid, deprecating expression of a dog when it rapidly but feebly wags its drooping tail. "'Mon Dieu! Mon Dieu!' she muttered, and, lifting her dress with one hand, she went up to her husband and kissed him on the forehead." "'Good-night, Lisa,' said he, rising and courteously kissing her hand, as he would have done to a stranger. End of chapter 7